Doesn't really need an introduction, Roll Tide. <laughs> so I'm uh, presenting on blindness following retro bull bar blocks. So this is kind of a topic that Dr. Patel gave to me. So when I was on plastic rotation at the beginning of the year, he said, feast, go block this eye. And so then he told me that if I perfed the globe, he'd make sure I was kicked out of the residency program. So I, I was able to do the block successfully, but like Dr. Warner always reminds me when I staff neuro patients with her, I'm a, I'm a worrier. So I was always really worried about what, what I was actually doing with that block and what, I, what is actually happening, cause, happening, because you always hear about the complications that come up with these. So most of the surgeries perform, performed now are done under topical anesthesia, but there's still a lot that we have to do with either a retrobulbar, peribulbar, or subtenons blocks. And we don't do a lot of these as residents. You know, I've, I've done hundreds of intravitreal injections, but then can count on one hand the number of retro bulbar blocks that I've done at this point. Um, and so in talking with Dr. Patel, kind of the goal was to hopefully come up with some I ideas to have safer retro bulbar, peribulbar, or subtenons blocks. Um, so just kind of the, the most basic aspect of this is what, does, what do these blocks do? So lidocaine, it binds to voltage-gated sodium channels and prevents the influx of sodium ions. So uh, this prevents the propagation of uh, action potentials down the neuron and prevents the transmission of signals, in this case pain. Um, the sensory fibers from the eye travel posteriorly, either through the ciliary ganglion as the short uh, ciliary nerves or uh, directly to the nasal ciliary nerve as the long ones. And then these enter the ophthalmic nerve, which is a branch of V1. So kind of the goal with these blocks, so this illustration was done by Lane Binion, one of the uh, medical illustrators that's done a lot with Dr. Patel, and he gave us some really nice pictures. So we're kind of shooting for the ciliary ganglion here. So it's, it's a tiny structure of about three millimeters in size. It's three millimeters lateral to the nerve. 10 millimeters, or 10 millimeters nasal to the lateral rectus and 15 millimeters posterior to the globe. So, you know, with this picture, it looks like it's a relatively straightforward shot, but then, you know, when you look at some of the other images, there's actually a lot more going on back there than you'd think. Um, so, with the retro bulbar block, a needle's introduced through the eyelid skin, the junction typically of the medial two-thirds and lateral third of the eyelid along the inferior orbital rim. It's passed uh, parallel to the orbital floor posteriorly and then redirected superiorly and medially to enter the muscle cone at the posterior border of the globe. And the aim with this is to instill anesthetic solution into the intraconal space. This is kind of contrasted with a peribulbar block. So it's again either given percutaneously or can be given through the conjunctival re uh, reflection. So the aim here is not to access the muscle cone, but just to instill uh, anesthetic into the retrobulbar space, but stay extraconal. Um, so this is theoretically less dangerous to the optic nerve and uh, those vital structures behind the eye than, than would be with a retrobulbar block, but it hasn't really panned out in some of the complication studies. And then the, one of the other ones that we see a lot of are subtenons blocks. Um, so you know, everybody does this differently in ophthalmology, but kind of the classic descriptions of papers were to access the infranasal quadrant, you uh, take down, uh, make a snip in tenons and conjunctiva, and then introduce a blunt curved cannula to deliver anesthetic posteriorly. So there's been lots of different reported complications. So with subtenons blocks, there is one uh, kind of case report series. They identified five complications. So they had two hyphemas, one central retinal artery occlusion, one suspected globe perforation, one episode of CNS depression, and then um, there's also been others that identified retrobulbar hemorrhage as a complication from a sub tenons block. Retrobulbar and peribulbar blocks are often classically associated with retrobulbar hemorrhages, central retinal artery occlusions, and then globe perforations. Um, this one study I found um, reported on 16,000 consecutive peribulbar blocks. Um, and so they had 12 cases of orbital hemorrhage, so uh, just under 1% of cases. They had one open globe, two expulsive hemorrhages, one grand mal seizure, and then no cases of cardiac or respiratory depression or death. So kind of my first question when, you know, when I was asked to do that first block was, you know, where exactly is my needle? Um, and that's, you know, not something that's easy to identify. We're used to, used to in ophthalmology being able to visualize what we're doing, you know, either at cataract surgery or during a vitrectomy, we, we can see our instruments. And with this, we're going through eyelid skin and going behind the eye, so we don't know where we are. 
So this study um, was actually, I believe, out of Brazil. So they examined the needle path dispersion of contrast media that was mixed in with anesthetic, and then the quality of an anesthesia um, in patients who underwent either a retrobulbar block or peribulbar block at the time of cataract surgery. So they selected 20 patients for retrobulbar injections. Needle was intraconal in only 50% of these cases based on the CT scan. Um, it penetrated the intraconal space and then passed extraconally onto the other side in about 25% uh, of cases. It remained exclusively extraconal in 10% of cases, and they couldn't identify the needle path in another, uh, in another 15%. Um, this is <coughs> kind of contrasted with peribulbar injections. So the needle was exclusively extraconal, which was the aim with this, in 65% uh, of their cases. So they had a uh, m more accurate with this, but they still penetrated the intraconal space and passed extraconally in about 20% of the cases, and again, weren't able to determine the location of the needle in another 15. So that was kind of concerning for me. Um, they mixed uh, uh, radio opaque contrast media, media uh, with the injectate at the time of the surgery and kind of looked at that with another scan kind of after the injection. So the contrast material in cases where they penetrated the uh, cone, it remained intraconal in, in those cases. Um, it remained strictly extraconal in their hands when they were either doing a, a peribulbar block or a retrobulbar that did not make it into the muscle cone. Um, and then they reported that the quality of the blocks determined by extracular motility measurements was significantly better in the retrobulbar group. So their, their findings with this were basically if you want to instill anesthetic into the retrobulbar space, it needs, into the intraconal space, it needs to be through a retrobulbar injection. Um, that peribulbar injection was not sufficient to access the intraconal space. But this has been contrasted with a couple of other papers um, that were kind of done in a similar fashion. So Ropo et al., which was an earlier paper, kind of performed a similar study but not on a large uh, subset of patients. So they took about 10 patients for each retrobulbar and 10 for peribulbar and CT scanned two of those. So in both cases of the retrobulbar injections, the needle tip was found to be intraconal. And in both cases of the peribulbar, it was found to be extraconal. But they mixed uh, the, uh, the iodinated uh, contrast material uh, in the same fashion. They used a little bit higher concentration, and they were able to identify uh, diffusion of the contrast material into the intraconal space in all cases of the injection. So all 10 retrobulbar and all 10 peribulbar injections. Uh, there's an, a kind of a, another study uh, that performed latex injections on disembodied cadaver heads. So one, one eye would be uh, blocked with a retrobulbar and then the other eye was a peribulbar. And then they examined the diffusion of the latex material after the heads had been fully sectioned. And they identified uh, latex material in the intraconal space in all 10 of the peribulbar heads. Um, and unfortunately, they actually identified it in the cavernous sinus in one of the peribulbar injections, too, and they weren't sure how to explain that because they weren't able to identify any needle tracks into any of the vessels. So that was also, I, I, I worried about that one, Dr. <laughs> Warren. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of different reasons that people can lose vision after a retrobulbar block, but not all of them are kind of these catastrophic retrobulbar hemorrhages or definite central retinal artery occlusion. So there's a lot of different things that go on. So we started looking at, you know, what happens to different structures of the eye when you do these anesthetic blocks. So in terms of the effects on the ocular blood flow, there's an ultrasound study that reported decreased choroidal and central retinal artery blood flow following a peribulbar injection of lidocaine, bupivacaine, and hyaluronidase without epinephrine. So the they didn't do kind of long-term studies, but they did found that the effect lasted for greater than five minutes in spite of a normal intraocular pressure. There was no change in the ophthalmic artery blood flow during this time, and so because of these findings, they, su they suspected that this was due to vasoconstriction of the uh, central retinal artery as a result of the anesthetic material, even though they were not using epinephrine in the study. <coughs> um, <coughs> Bible and Guyton reported on some complications following subtenons blocks, and they postulated that a loculated cyst of the anesthetic material may form in the subtenons uh, capsule that can potentially cause compression of the uh, central retinal artery and cause an artery occlusion in that manner. 
And then Meyer et al. in an IOVS study from the 90s uh, reported on local anesthetics by themselves reducing endothelial relaxation in response to bradykinin. So the bradykinin pathway is up, upstream of the nitric oxide pathway. So when you block response to bradykinin, you block production of nitric oxide and you block dilation of the blood vessels. So that kind of create, creates a, a pro vasospastic environment for the, the blood vessels in proximity to lidocaine, even in the absence of of any epinephrine. So what happens to the actual vision? So there's been a few papers that reported on visual evoked potentials following the use of these anesthetics. So Levinsky performed VEP on 16 patients who underwent cataract surgery with either a peribulbar or a retrobulbar block. Um, this was, they performed these um, patients pre-op and then one month post-op, so nothing in the immediate perioperative period. But fortunately, they didn't identify any long-lasting VEP effects in any of their patients, and all of those patients did achieve 20-20 best corrected vision. Ropo et al. reported <coughs> that <coughs> peribulbar blocks had either a slight to no effect on the VEP, while retrobulbar block induced a non-recordable VEP in 28% of eyes and decreased amplitudes in another 28% 28 per, 28 of eyes. This was performed during the perioperative period. Um, and then Pruitt took a page out of uh, Dr. Creel's book and bought a bunch of cats and um, experimented on them. So they reported in 1967 that retrobulbar injection of lidocaine consistently blocked the light evoked potential in cats. So you know, you've got blood vessels and then you have the optic nerve. And so, unfortunately, brainstem anesthesia has been also reported following these cases. So, you know, they identified the latex in the cavernous sinus. And in some of these studies, so Cobet et al. reported the identification of lidocaine in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid of a patient who uh, had uh, respiratory depression following a retrobulbar block. Um, it's presumed to be due to a direct penetration of the of the optic nerve sheath, and that, that allows it to travel posteriorly. But that's it, again makes me worry. So, the, so the question is really, what should we expect after a block? So, you know, most of the time when I'm in in the OR with the surgeons or the attendings, you always hear the patients talk about, oh, I see, I see the light, I, I see the instruments moving, and everybody's like, okay, hold still. And so, you know, it's not really quite clear what you're supposed to expect after these blocks. So, I mean, Dr. Zog, when you do a PK, what, what do you expect in terms of the vision during the, in the OR? Um, it's kind of variable, but some people say they can't see anything, which is kind of like, <coughs> usually they're able to see at least light. Dr. Mammoth, when was the last time you did a <laughs> you know, since I only use them now for chirurgia, I don't really ask the people what they're seeing. So, because we actually cover the corneas, I don't know. It's been a while, but yeah, when it was when we were blocking every patient for cataract surgery, it was variable. We had some patients who could see the light fully and see the instruments, and again, we had others who it was just black. Lights out. Yeah. So, I'm gonna since I wasn't the one that was doing those blocks in those cases, I didn't worry as much about those, but I could see why people would. So this paper, Levin et al. reported a positive APD in about 31% of patients who underwent a retrobulbar block. So during the peri that was during the perioperative period, so 19% had a visual acuity better than uh, 6 over 200, and 73% of their patients were able to describe uh, <coughs> movements of instruments during the surgery. Talks et al. reported on peribulbar blocks. So they found a positive APD in about 85% of patients. Um, and they found that all of their patients had decreased visual acuity with 35% recovering immediately postoperatively. During the surgery, about 25% were no light perception and 65% were count fingers or worse. Chen et al. reported no light perception vision in about 93.3% of patients who underwent a subtenons block for combi combined cataract and vitrectomy. And then in a more recent study on the, on the effects of topical anesthesia, Rengaraj et al. reported that no patients undergoing topical anesthesia for cataract surgery experienced no, uh, no light perception vision. And that was compared with about 10% of patients who had a retrobulbar block during that time. So, I, was, I looked up a bunch of different complications uh, so that I would lose even more sleep, and they 
I found about 20 cases of uh, postoperative vision loss. So 20% of these were in patients who had a retrobulbar block, 20% with a peribulbar block, and 55% with a subtenons block. And Dr. Patel, there's also one patient who uh, was undergoing a blepharoplasty and uh, had upper eyelid injection and medial fat pad injection who also lost vision. Worry. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, over, the, over the span of these cases, lidocaine was used in about 13%, so just over half of them. It was used alone in nine, or in nine of the cases. It was used with bupivacaine in four of the cases. And otherwise, the authors <coughs> used <coughs> bupivacaine alone or with mixtures in mepivacaine or rapivacaine. Um, hyaluronidase was only used in about nine cases, so about 45%. Vision loss was reported to be due to uh, central retinal artery occlusion in the majority of cases, so uh, 55%. So uh, two of these came from a peribulbar block, four came from a retrobulbar block, and then the remaining five came from a subtenons block. Uh, ciliary retinal artery occlusion occurred in one case following a subtenons block. Globe perforation, which I, I didn't perform thankfully, um, was in one case following a subtenons block, which they found a little unusual because they had used a blunt cannula and uh, didn't try to pass the needle vigorously, but the eye filled with blood and they sent them to a retinal specialist who performed a vitrectomy and found a needle track. So if the retina specialist looked at it and found a needle track, you know they're right because they've never been wrong, so. Um, and then the, there is direct anesthesia to the optic nerve or brain in two cases following subtenons block. Um, and then the cause of vision loss was not postulated in the others. So of these 20 cases, uh, about 12 of them had uh, visual acuity improvement to 2060 or better, and most of those actually recovered to 2020. Three cases recovered to 2200 or worse, and then in five of them, the vision, the visual recovery was not reported. So this is, you know, I had hoped to kind of come up with some tips for, you know, how to avoid complications during this, but there's a lot of, a lot of potential reasons why somebody could lose vision following this, and, you know, a lot of, we do a lot of different blocks, and the, the fortunately the incidence is low, but it still happens, and you know, I think with the numbers that we'd have to look at, we're getting into big data, so I'm going to have to turn this over to Dr. Stagg when he goes to Michigan. Um, but I was hoping just to get some input from, from everybody here who's had way more experience than I have, but, you know, not all the vision loss that we see with the block is abnormal, so when should we start worrying about it? You know, obviously when somebody develops a tense orbit, that's, that's a sign to worry, but, you know, if, you do, if you're doing a PK and somebody says they can't see light during the case, you don't necessarily get alarmed, but when, when should you, you know? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. It's interesting you actually say that, because I had a case once. We, we do retroval blocks almost routinely for mm -hmm. our camera still, because we don't have preserved food. And uh, many of the patients, we do tell them, um, you know, vision a little blurry, a little off, uh, immediately post-surgery. And uh, I had a patient went home, after the block, uh, he's, he's accepting that his vision is not so well. Came back two days later with a severe retinal occlusion, and uh, it's, it's probably the Yeah, so you know, I was I was hoping to have an answer. Say, you know, if the if the block doesn't wear off by forty five minutes, then that's something to worry about. But I, I couldn't find anything in the literature about when when the vision is expected to be recovered by. So, Dr. Roscoe. So, just I mean, um, you said when to worry, but with respiratory suppression, um, first-hand experience, that you know immediately. Yeah. Dr. Petty? Yeah, so um, hey. a lot of times we're patching these patients because mm -hmm. uh, they can't take their corners. So you know, they're, they're not necessarily taking their patch until the next day. So I don't really have a great answer. I think I think essentially every report block I've done, whether it's um, doing outreach, cataract surgery, or here, we patch until the next day. Yeah. In retina surgery, obviously, you know, patients, lots of them have no light perception but many of them can describe the instruments exactly. And when we didn't use, there was a time when we couldn't get hyaluronidase, and you could really tell lots more patients could see exactly what was going on. And some, some like it and some don't. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A couple of comments. I collected uh, years ago, there was a prominent local 
cataract surgeon that had a, a nurse anesthetist giving all his blocks. And I collected a whole series of eyes that went blind, uh, were blinded immediately. And a couple of comments. Um, if you're using hyaluronidase, you're going to get a better block. And if you're compressing the eye after the block, you get fewer complications. As Boopy will tell you, there was a time in plastic surgery when the, the leading legal case, successful legal case against plastic surgeons was loss of vision after blepharoplasty in the United States. And I've seen many of those cases where they got very aggressive with removing orbital fat. And even if they did inject, they, they patch those patients or include those patients or ice pack those patients and they, and they ended up losing vision to one extent or another. So I think that uh, practically being a corneal surgeon and giving a lot of blocks over 35 years, um, compression after a block I think cuts down on the complications and the use of hyaluronidase. And my experience is that the Terry Bulbar blocks are just as successful and a lot safer in, in ophthalmologist hands, but especially in non-MD hands. I think people that are doing uh, blocks, uh, anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists who are doing blocks with inch and a half needles are going to get into trouble. Mm -hmm. So the juice, juice and I are coming up with some guidelines for post fracture repairs, and that's one of the common legal <coughs> causes of surgeons losing the cases before the case even starts because they're patched with the eye further. And the other one that we did come up a few years ago, we kind of established that if you do a leprosy, do not put a firm patch on the patient at the You have to check the vision and leave the patch on. And if you feel you're not bleeding, you need to put a patch on. You keep the patient in the clinic, full stop there until you are happy. You know, we sometimes face problems upstairs, the nurses all to go home. And you can't predict how patients will turn up. There are times when I'll say, I'm sorry, we just sit and wait. We're going to admit the patient overnight. It's $12,000 cost to admit them overnight. It takes two or three hours to watch them. So sometimes it will change the way we practice. I have to say to you, if, you know, if, I, have a, if I need a surgeon, I want a surgeon like Feast. I took him through a ptosis repair on the patient, one eye lady, the other eye was exaggerated, so there was no balance. I said to him at the end, are you happy now? He says, no, I'm worried. I said, what are you worried about now? He says the lid may be too high or it may be too low, you know, one eye person. So I, so I said to him, every height is good for a person, but he's still worried. He wants to see the patient next, next day, the day after. Yes, sir. The other comment is just learning from Boopy and other uh, ocular plastics. You know, look at the literature. If you do a block and you patch, the majority of those people will end up with ptosis. And we see it all the time in cornea where we've done a cornea transplant. The patient comes back and you think, well, that eyelid's lower just because of inflammation or something. But you look at them a year or two or five years later, and that lid stays down. So a pressure patch keeps the oculoplastics people busy, I think. <laughs> um, so looking at all this stuff, if you're going to do a surgery reason, you need an akinetic anesthetized eye. Did you decide which block you'd like to do? I don't know. I think the ones that found that the diffusion material like didn't get into the intraconal space was a minority. And just I think from the clinical experience, that peribulbar blocks seem to be sufficient. So I, I would probably vote for that. I mean, it was kind of one of those pictures towards the back that if it were just me having it, I would, I would probably want the Perry Boulevard block because there's just a lot of other stuff back there too, so. Yeah. So uh, I, oh, on that first, one of the first pictures I think you showed on the uh, needle going back. Yes. Uh, if I get the diagram right, Usually, we try to put the bevel, you know, toward the flow. Yeah. I think when they do that picture, <coughs> it's, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> this was so. This this picture we actually got about nine o'clock last night. Yeah. So, um, it's. I mean, <coughs> just a comment, what Dr. Miller said. Are you? Is the feeling that anybody who has had a block and a patch whether or not they've had lid surgery, so assuming they have not had any eyelid surgery, are you saying that if you 
do a block and a patch that that will predispose to ptosis in that patient? Right. If you look at the studies, if you look at it, you get disinsertion. I'm on a flat. You get disinsertion, especially if you use a pressure patch beyond what you have anesthesia, because the patient will try to stretch that eyelid open, and you get in disinsertion of the levator. And you look at look at them, and you know if I look at my cornea patients, I mean I can walk in, and I can five years after they've had the transplant, if I at the time I was blocking. Them. I do most of mine under general for that reason now, and I don't put, uh, I don't, you, you got to be careful, the same way with general pressure patch. I don't patch as much, and if I give a re regular block on a, like a mature cataract, I use, only, I don't pressure patch, I just use ointment. So comments from plastics on that? Yeah, so, could you, uh, it's something like 12% of cataract patients just after standard modern cataract surgery would have measurable ptosis within three months of surgery. But what that tells you is using a lid speculum that pulling in the opposite way is enough just to take a rarefied aponeurosis and weaken it a little bit more. So taking it the opposite way, just, you're absolutely right, the pressure patch will stretch the rarefied um, attachments so that will give you disinsertion, whether it's associated with the fact that as the block wears off, there's a secondary contraction of the weight muscle. People will tell you under a patch, I can feel my eyelid opening, and they'll try and close it further, and there's this constant pressure. If you're lucky enough to have a hematoma or ecchymosis, you can be guaranteed there's going to be disinsertion of the weight Do you know, I have patients coming to me probably monthly saying, I want Dr. Crandall to pay for my ptosis surgery. and say, sorry, we did my cataract surgery and he gave me ptosis. And I said, no, no, that's not how it happened. You are weakening coming along already. And so, I'm not saying they're all from Crabble, AC. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they wouldn't blame the cataract surgeon that he gave me the ptosis. What they forget is, ptosis will be coming on. This is the final insult, if you like. And so, you, you just need 200 microns of droop to become those. This is cosmetically, if you like. So, that could just be from the lid spectrum. You could be topical anesthesia with a. Yeah, I think for any lid that's very interesting. Dr. Carl? Did you find any we in neuroophthalmology get diplopia after retrobulbar and peribulbar blocks because of direct action and mm -hmm. on the muscles? Muscle. Yeah. Did you yeah, so I mean, I saw stuff like that, but um, I was, I, I kind of limited it to just the actual vision yeah, so loss. I'm looking at myotoxicity, but those are well described. Myotoxicity after retrobulbar blocks, and that means percentage like 2%, but permanent double vision. We were concentrating on sort of retrobulbar approach and see there's a better retrobulbar even we could design. Uh, the history of Moran is very interesting. We went through a period about 20, oh, 2006 to 2010 when several of the uh, uh, surgeons called me to give a retrobulbar block before they could do the case. I was sort of the retrobulbar guru because, you know, they've all become topical jobs. They've forgotten how to do retrobulbar. <laughs> You'd be surprised how often you get a small hematoma back there. It's got this needle floating about. I found that comment very interesting. Who said, bevel up, bevel down. Don't forget, your needle penetrates not from bevel up or bevel down. It's the tip that penetrates your eyeball. Because I think sometimes we fool ourselves into being scientists. But it's the tip that will poke. And if you say it's bevel up, the tip is further away. It's only further away by about 200 microns. So you've got to be careful where the tip is going. I don't know that any of us can claim to be brilliant retrobulbar ejectors. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'll just tell you a story which will start true here. I had a, a fellow resident, when we were both residents, we were doing extra caps in the cataracts. And we were doing them, we, we really get really fast. And we could do an extra cap in about 15 minutes. We we're having lunch, and uh, Stevie K again is complaining to me, our oh, life is boring, I need to do something else. This cataract, I can do them. 100 a day, you know, we're just having this resident power. He calls me the next day and he says, uh, you've got to come over, you've got to come over. He, he had had two retrobulbar hemorrhages sequentially, consecutive cases. Both of them developed a huge hemorrhage and both of them went new, new, no light perception with them. It, the, the lesson is, it doesn't matter how good you think you are, 
complications will occur and sometimes an injury will be And he was using a blunt needle. So instead of that needle which had a sharp tip, they make red revolver, blunt needles, and, and he got two red revolver hemorrhages all the way to NLP, one after the other. It's enough to make you want to give up doing any surgery. Peace, that would worry you. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. In, in your study that were you looking at complications, were those needles virtual or needles, or were they sharp? Uh, I don't remember, actually, for most of them. I have to go back and look. So, yeah. Well, the, the one that worried me the most was the subtenons globe perforation, too. So. Well, I mean, the thing is, there's reporting bugs, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. not going to report no. complications from a virtual cord block because it's already been reported. Yeah. From the test of Tina, people say, oh, you know, yeah. this, is this is supposed to be safe. This is safe. Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely a little bit of a trend. I was going to say, the other very one all these is how much volume are you putting back there? Uh, it could be anywhere from four MLs to eight MLs. I've been with a surgeon who did three retro bull bars in a row because he wasn't getting out of the end. He probably put 18 MLs in a row. So, I mean, I'm sure that the amount of volume matters as well. Potentially to a closed space with the intercompany space. So. And one thing is, you know, I, I often see residents pulling uh, back on the, on the plunger. You know, they really just pull back. Um, to, so they make sure they're not in a vessel. But really, if you're in a vessel and you just pull back a little bit, you'll know. You don't have to pull back so much that you're actually getting air coming back. God knows what you're well, sucking right. into the tip. Yeah. Yes. I, I did have a couple of cases once where uh, just doing very bulwark block. I did like a little right bulwark. My bulwark, uh, I came in the anterior chamber. It didn't seem to bother the surgery, but it did bother you that there was some blood in the anterior chamber. Did, it, did they talk about anything like that? Um, just some kind of more more grossly visible hyphemas uh, following subtenons blocks. And I think you know, like maybe one of those is in a, I, I don't think there were cataract cases. I think there were like maybe pterygium or in something else. So. All right.